So, uh, hello everyone. Uh, let's talk about our next lecture. So, today we are going to talk about the leucine zipper motifs. So, this is uh, another type of uh, protein motif that can recognize the DNA. So, uh, many gene regulatory proteins, they interact with the DNA or recognize the DNA as homodimers because this is the uh, simplest way of achieving strong and specific uh, binding. So, as you can see here, in case of uh, uh, leucine zipper motifs, why do we call them uh, zipper motifs? Is because they have a zipper-like uh, fashion where uh, the two monomers of um, this motif, they wrap around each other in, in, in the form of a zipper. So basically there are two regions of this protein. Uh, there's one region re which recognizes the, um, the DNA while there's another region which uh, wraps around uh, each other. So uh, the region or the helices of the motif which wrap around each other, uh, generally they are uh, joined together to form a coil-like structure and these two helices they are held together uh, with each other by the interaction uh, between the hydrophobic amino acid side chains which are located here and most of the time it's the leucine residues in le and, and, and the, which interact with each other uh, so because of having uh, because of having a hydrophobic uh, nature so that's the reason uh, why they are called as leucine zipper motifs uh, so uh, just beyond this dimerization, this this uh, these two monomers they split apart, they separate from each other because of the presence of uh, rather uh, basic amino acids in this region. So they do not uh, have this uh, hydrophobic interaction in this region. That's why these two alpha helices are uh, separated from each other and then they interact with the DNA while these uh, two alpha helices which have got these hydrophobic amino acid side chains uh, they uh, they coil around each other and they form this uh, what we call uh, coiled coil structure or zipper like uh, structure how do uh, these prote proteins recognize the DNA we have also previously uh, discussed this uh, that specific amino acid sequence is necessary to recognize a specific sequence of nucleotides. Um, here's an example of uh, uh, bacteriophage lambda core protein. Uh, we have previously discussed this, if you remember, when we were talking about the, uh, uh, about the transcription factors, uh, that there are different types of transcription factors and they can recognize uh, different uh, DNA sequences. It is basically the same example. Uh, as you can see, this is one strand of the DNA, 5 prime to 3 prime, and this is the second strand of the DNA, 5 prime to 3 prime. And uh, both of these two strands, they have a specific sequence. But what is interesting here is that uh, the nucleotides, which are uh, indicated in green here, they are arranged symmetrically means if you uh, look at this strand, strand uh, 5 prime to 3 prime it the sequence is a a c a and c and the same is true for the other strand as well uh, the sequence is a a c a c so it means both of these two sequences are identical so it means both of these two sequences can be identified by identical protein motifs so uh, this one indicated in green, green is one motif of the zipper and here is the second motif of the zip of the zipper so uh, as you can see uh, because both of them are going to recognize the identical sequences or the dna contains identical sequences on both the sides that's why what is uh, needed here is a homodimer so uh, so that one uh, monomer can recognize this sequence on one strand and the other monomer can recognize this sequence on the other strand. So if this sequence, for example, varies and is different from the other sequence, then the green monomer may not be able to bind to the DNA. So in that particular case, you might need a heterodimer. One monomer that would recognize this sequence and the other monomer that would recognize this sequence. So the only difference in this case is the orientation. And why the orientation? Because uh, the two strands of the DNA, they are anti-parallel. 
going from 5 prime to 3 prime like this and from 5 prime to the 3 prime like this so if this is a uh, homodimer we need identical DNA sequences on both the strands that would be recognized by each of the two monomers but if one of the two sequences if one strand has a different sequence than and the than the other strand then obviously you need uh, a different monomer so they then then what is needed is a heterodimer so that it can recognize one sequence on one strand and and a different sequence on the uh, other strand and then bind to the dna uh, here's an example of a half of an alpha helix uh, so we know that this is a right-handed um, uh, helical uh, so, so it's a uh, right-handed coil like structure and uh, what you see here this is a single alpha helix with successive amino acid side chains which are labeled uh, uh, in a sound fold sequence that is a b c d e f n g from starting from bottom to top so a b c d e f g basically indicate uh, let's say different uh, um, amino acids so a is one amino acid b is the second amino acid c third d fourth e fifth f sixth and G is the seventh amino acid but these seven amino acids in this example they keep repeating themselves so they start from A and go all the way to G and then they start over again A B C D E F G A B C D E F G A B C D E F G so these seven amino acids are repeating themselves in this alpha helix so what you see here uh, we have this red stripe here so the red stripe indicates basically two among these seven amino acids are hydrophobic in nature so uh, a and d this is 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 a, a and d so what we see here because we have roughly i don't know three point something uh, amino acids per turn so uh, if we have seven seven amino acids uh, we are not going to have uh, an exactly it's, it's uh, i don't exactly remember it's either 3.5 or 3. Point, not 5 3.5 perhaps 3.6 amino acids per turn so what's happening is that uh, uh, d is not sitting right on top of a so every second d is shifted slightly more towards the left on this coil and the same is true for a, a is starting from here and then it goes here second a and third a appears here fourth a here fifth a here and sixth a here so basically that indicates that these amino acids these hydrophobic amino acids uh, they're slightly shifting towards the left of this uh, alpha helix this is more clearly visible here so if we had uh, all of them um, on top of each other like in in, in 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 a straight line then uh, the two strands of these monomers perhaps could unite with each other but not in a coiled fashion so this coiled fashion basically or this structure originates from uh, the uh, uh, from the shifting of these hydrophobic amino acids on, on, on the alpha helix so they're not lying on top of each other like this rather there's a slight shift as they go around these turns in the alpha helix so they're slightly there's a slight uh, you can say there's a slight um, off shift in this uh, coil so that leads so when the two strands come close to each other the hydrophobic side chains or the amino acids with the hydrophobic side chains they interact with each other so in case of leucine zipper motifs most of them are leucine in this case they would bind to each, each, each other and the hydrophobic amino acids will be uh, they will be wrapped in between they will be hidden and the more hydrophilic amino acids they will be exposed towards the outside to face the um, aqueous environment and this is this is basically a um, uh, Coiled coil structure, which was determined by X ray crystallography. So, um, these are hydrophobic or non polar amino acids. Uh, they're going to interact with each other to lead to the formation of a uh, 
uh, zipper-like structure. So uh, we have discussed this that uh, proteins, these, these transcription factors or the DNA binding proteins, they tend to make um, heterodimers or homodimers. So uh, why, do, why would we need uh, homodimers or heterodimers? Uh, as you can see here, we have previously discussed in the previous example, if the two monomers are identical, then the DNA sequence that they recognize, they also need to be identical. So that would be uh, once, uh, well, this monomer would be recognizing uh, one strand of the DNA and this is recognizing the other strand of the DNA and this is how they would uh, bind to the DNA. So if this is a monomer, sorry, sorry, if this is a homodimer, then both of these monomers can recognize identical sequences which are indicated here in blue. And if we see here, uh, this is a different color. Um, this is also a homodimer but this different color uh, indicates means it's it's different from the green one so this is a different type of homodimer and this is the reason this is going to recognize a different uh, dna sequence so this dna sequence is different from the one indicated here in blue so these uh, red dna sequences uh, these can be recognized by uh, let's say these are yellow in color i don't know light green perhaps um, let's call them yellow so these red uh, structures they are indicate they, they, uh, these red uh, dna sequences they are indicated they're, sorry they are recognized by these uh, um, uh, yellow yellow homodimers and if the dna sequences if there is a scenario where the dna sequences are different means as we discussed here on the previous slide that this sequence on one strand of the DNA is different from the sequence on the other strand of the DNA then we cannot have a homodimer we would need a different type of monomer in order to bind with the green one we would need a different type of monomer a monomer that would be able to recognize a different sequence here so this is depicted here that if you have two uh, different sequences um, on the two strands of the DNA and the protein needs to bind to it as a dimer then we would need a heterodimer and this heterodimerization increases the repertoire of DNA sequences that these uh, gene regulatory proteins can recognize and bind to um, why because um, having these homodimer uh, sequences or identical sequences on the DNA uh, may not be very uh, common uh, so in in often um, Often in, 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 in there, there could be scenarios, there could be situations uh, where uh, most of the times the two DNA sequences, they're different. So most of the scenarios could be something like this. So if this is the case, then you would need heterodimers. So the two monomer, uh, monomers that would bind to each other, they should be able to recognize two different DNA sequences. So a homodimer may not be able to bind to this type of DNA sequences. And that happens very, very often. And uh, if you have these uh, uh, a homodimer, this can recognize only one type of the uh, DNA sequence. But if we look at the possibility of heterodimerization, then multiple different types of monomers can bind to each other in order to adjust themselves according to the uh, according to the DNA sequences in that particular region of the DNA. If that's a regulatory sequence, then if this is not red, this is, let's say, magenta, then you can bind the green monomer with a magenta color, uh, let's say, monomer. And if this is a yellow one, maybe a yellow uh, mono, uh, sorry, a yellow uh, monomer can bind to the green monomer. So you can vary this sequence and you can change these monomers. So the green monomer can bind to different types of other monomers in order to be able to bind to this particular DNA sequence. Okay, uh, let's talk about the uh, combinatorial possibilities uh, which may develop as a result of uh, heterodimeric uh, combination of the different transcription factors. Here's an example. Uh, we have factor A, we have factor B, and we have factor C. These are three different types of factors, and these are monomers. So 
this is the activation domain of the monomer and this is the DNA binding domain of the monomer. And on the other hand, we also have an inhibitory factor which has the ability to bind to factor A. So let's see if you have, what is the advantage of having this heterodimerization, dimerization. why do we say that heterodimerization increases the repertoire of DNA sequences? How could they recognize uh, different sequences? So if we talk about the uh, homodimers, then a homodimer of two uh, factor A monomers would be able to recognize only one DNA sequence. And um, a homodimer of factor B can recognize site 2, while a homodimer of factor C can recognize site 3. But if heterodimerization is possible, then A can make a heterodimer with B and recognize a different sequence of the DNA. Factor A can also recognize factor so, so, sorry, can, uh, factor A can also bind with factor C and can recognize a different DNA sequence. And once again, factor B and C can also bind with each other in order to, uh, in order to form a heterodimer and then recognize a different DNA site. So the sites are also divided into two half sites. Uh, basically, um, they indicate that uh, these are dimers, which are one dimer is recognizing uh, a site on one strand of the DNA and second um, uh, factor is uh, or second monomer is recognizing the other half site on the, uh, on the, on the, on the DNA sequence. And in this uh, case we see that different combinations of these three uh, factors, they can, uh, they, they, they increase the uh, number of sequences that uh, can be recognized by these uh, heterodimers. So in this case, uh, if you look at example two, for example, um, uh, yeah, if you look at uh, example two, uh, we, we see that we have an inhibitory factor. So if this inhibitory factor binds to factor A, we have previously discussed that there could be other factors which bind to these monomers and can rather inactivate them. So in this example, in, 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 in uh, A, what you see is that uh, homodimerization or heterodimerization is leading to the uh, active binding of these uh, proteins to their respective DNA sequences. But there could be uh, uh, situations where rather a different type of monomer binds to factor A. So in this case, this is an inhibitory factor. So this inhibitory factor can bind to uh, factor A. This only binds with factor A. So all the different possibilities where factor A could bind like site 1, site 4 and site 5. These could be recognized by factor A. So when this inhibitory factor binds to factor A, factor A cannot bind to site 1, site 4 and site 5. So the transcriptional activation at all these sites, at all the, these three sites that is inhibited but activation at uh, site 2, site 3 and site 6 is not affected. So whatever factor this inhibitory factor binds to, that may not be able to bind to its respective DNA sequences, uh, its, its respective DNA, DNA sequence. So if this inhibitory factor binds to factor C, then we would see that there would be no activation on site 3 and on site 6. Okay, let's move to the next slide. Here is another example of uh, uh, combinatorial uh, transcriptional regulation. We call this cooperative DNA binding. So uh, what you see in this case, this is slightly different. Uh, rather than, uh, so what you see here is uh, this is a heterodimer. So in principle, this if this heterodimer is capable of recognizing its uh, particular DNA sequence, it should bind to it and activate the transcription. But there could be scenarios where enti two entirely different transcription factors, they interact with each other. They interact with each other. In this case, we have this NFAT and AP1. Uh, AP1. So these two transcription factors, they would interact with each other, what we call protein-protein interaction. Why? Because 
the pining sites on the DNA they're weak pining sites so this is a weak AnFET pining site and this is a weak AP1 binding site so basically uh, both of these two transcription factors they're involved in the transcriptional activation of IL-2 that is interleukin-2 um, interleukin-2 uh, is a uh, is a cytokine um, it's an interleukin and which is involved in lots of inflammatory responses and if something uh, goes wrong with it an abnormal expression of uh, IL-2 may lead to uh, autoimmune diseases like uh, rheumatoid arthritis so uh, the uh, the activation of IL-2 is dependent upon the binding of both of these two transcription factors to their binding sites so they are binding to the uh, uh, proximal uh, promoter region of the or to the proximal control element of the promoter region so uh, this is the binding site for AP1 and this is binding site for NFAT and IL-2 cannot get itself expressed until both of them until and unless both NFAT and AP1 AP1 bind to its regulatory to their regulatory sequences and they cannot bind to their regulatory sequences when they are uh, uh, present alone so uh, AP1 would need the presence of NFAT so there would be a protein protein interaction as you can see here and then a stable binding between the DNA and these two transcription factors what we call a, a, a complex this would be an NFAT AP1 and DNA uh, complex uh, this complex would be established when uh, both NFAT and AP1 would be present they would interact with each other and that would lead to the stable binding of both of these two transcription factors to the DNA alone either of them cannot effectively bind to the DNA and cannot lead to the uh, actuation of uh, IL-2 uh, transcription. So uh, this is the overall summary of our previous lectures, uh, perhaps five or six lectures. Uh, we talked about the helix turn helix motifs and then we talked about a special class of helix turn helix motifs which was known as homeodomain motifs then we talked about the helix loop helix motifs then we talked about the uh, sorry the zinc finger motifs and then at the end we talked about the leucine uh, zipper motifs uh, i hope uh, you could follow all these lectures we are more or less done, done with uh, the transcription factors uh, thank you very much for paying attention and if you have any other questions do uh, drop your questions in the google classroom and I would like to answer those questions in my next lecture. Thank you very much.